The backup strategy I use is actually really comprehensive. I've got five copies of the Mac data and all of the active projects that I'm working on at any point in time. And through those five copies and the various ways they're set up, I'm protected against hardware failure, human error, all the natural disasters like fire, flood and theft, as well as ransomware attacks. And in spite of how comprehensive it is, it's actually really affordable and very straightforward to set up. The whole thing's almost completely automated. If you take working with computers seriously like I do, you'll enjoy the process I've gone down on this channel where I've optimized these keyboards. And so this is a process you actually design and build your own custom keyboard. The whole thing is really fantastic. It's very affordable. And if you go down that road, you'll need a PCB manufacturer like PCBWay, who are kindly sponsoring this video. And they make these PCBs, this bit which you design and upload the files to and they'll manufacture it and send it to you. I was using PCBWay before they started sponsoring these videos as well. I've never had any technical problems with the boards they provide. They actually don't just do PCBs, they do CNC and 3D printing and OEM assembly as well and I'm very happy to recommend the service they provide. Back to this killer backup strategy. Now this is going to work for pretty much any kind of data requirements. Obviously I'm using it for YouTube so I use a fair bit of space but it'll work just as well for whatever kind of things you do. Obviously if you're not using video you'll probably get away with a lot less space requirements but the process is going to be the same. What I've done to create this strategy is define four risk profiles. Now these risk profiles are based on a varying combination of the following three things. The first of these is scope. So are we talking about a single file that might have gone missing or are we talking about complete destruction of your whole premises? So the second is likelihood. So how likely is this fault going to happen? How likely is this event going to arise? Uh, if it's a very rare thing obviously it means you can potentially take a little bit longer to recover the data. If it's very common you want very fast access to that data. And the third is time frame. So how long ago is the event likely to happen? So the few scenarios where the actual event that lost your data might not have happened just now. It might be some time ago before you realize. So these three things will all shape the kind of mechanisms we're going to use to protect our data against the following four risk profiles. So if we look at human error first, so the scope of this is usually quite small. It's usually limited to a few files. And the time frame is not always necessarily recent. It might be some time before you realize the mistake you've made and you want to go back to an earlier version. So we need to take that into account. And the likelihood of this one is quite high as well. It's fairly common to make small mistakes on a computer and you want to revert to an earlier version of the file. So the next one we can look at is hardware failure. And obviously that's pretty big scope. It's not necessarily all your drives. It might just be one, but obviously it's all the files on that drive. So pretty sizable scope. Time frame, it, you know when your hard drive is gone. Your time frame is obviously very recent only. And then in terms of likelihood of happening, hard drives do fail. It's not that uncommon for a hard drive to fail. So we need to be ready for it really. If we look at ransomware, you can see the scope is huge. The potential is that all your drives are locked out by some ransomware attack. And the time frame again is actually slightly unknown. You don't necessarily know as soon as it's happened. There may be a delay on the locking process before that point in time where the virus has actually got onto your machine. So time frame slightly unknown. Scope is massive, but the likelihood is pretty low. So lastly, we can look at the disaster, fire, flood, or theft. So the scope is obviously massive. It's all your data. It's everything on site that's gone. The likelihood is very low, and the time frame is obviously only up to the minute. You know as soon as this has happened. Now I've used this concept for a while and it's based around a simple idea that you use your internal storage on the Mac or computer you're using, uh, which is usually solid state and very fast for your active projects. So you want the storage space on that internal drive to be big enough for any concurrent projects you're working on at any one point in time. And then you have a directly connected hard drive for your kind of archive storage that you don't need all the time. You're not actively working on it. Those projects are sort of moved on to there when they're complete and then you leave them on there. The first thing we want to do is add protection for this primary system drive with all your active projects as well as all your emails and all of the applications and everything on that system. Because we're protecting against hardware failure, we need this to be a reasonably fast mechanism to restore it because it's quite probable that at some point you're going to have this issue to deal with. You don't want to be waiting a week for a hard drive from online backup to be posted to you through the post. You need to be getting up and running much quicker than that with this kind of profile. The mechanism I use to protect this primary system drive is I use Carbon Copy Cloner, which is a brilliant bit of software to create a daily backup of the whole system drive onto a new separate hard drive overnight when I'm not working with those files. So in terms of the size of this backup drive, you might think you can get away with just having exactly the same size as your system drive. But I've actually had issues in the past where Carbon copy cloner would complain uh, that it couldn't manage to do something because there wasn't enough space on that backup drive so it would go slightly bigger uh, maybe double or you know at least 50 percent bigger so the reason we keep this dedicated drive that is at most one day old and it's just a clone there's no version history here on this one is for two reasons so firstly we can do a little neat trick that turns this into an off-site backup as well so all we do is we add a second version of this backup drive
drive, we keep that off site. And then every sort of three to seven days, you just rotate the two over and you have carbon copy cloner set to make the same backup clone to each of those drives. So as soon as it's swapped over and plugged into the new drive, it will just start using that one for its daily backup. And as soon as you swap it over, you've got a reasonably up to date offsite backup of your whole system straight away. So now we're not only just protected against hardware failures, we're actually protected against complete on-site disaster as well because we've got an off-site copy. The other reason why we keep this as a separate dedicated drive is for the speed of recovery. So obviously for hardware failure, we do want that faster recovery and it's a nice to have for the on-site disaster speed of recovery as well. And because we're using a single dedicated clone of the drive here, it's much faster to recover the data from that than it would be from say Time Machine, which is why we're not using Time Machine for this situation. So speaking of Time Machine, this is the mechanism we're gonna to use to protect us from human error. So what we want is a way of going back through time for all of the projects that we're actively working on. And because we know this system drive is the only place we're actively working on projects, we only need to think about Time Machine for this drive. So that's a nice little way of keeping things simple here. Time Machine is an amazing thing that is included with every Mac as part of the operating system. And it's an absolutely fantastic backup mechanism for all the data on your Mac. So for this, we're gonna have a separate dedicated hard drive just for the purposes of Time Machine. And it's gonna always be connected via USB to the Mac here. So it's nice and fast, it's ready, it's there. Time Machine can just do its thing. And uh, it's nice and simple and very affordable because it's just another drive and it doesn't have to be fast or fancy. It can just do its thing quietly in the background. So we're just using a normal cheap hard drive here. And I'm using an eight terabyte drive for my two terabytes internal storage. So you want to make sure it's a good bit bigger than that internal storage. Obviously the more space you have, the further back in time it will be able to store files. So a good, uh, well, I've got four times the capacity there should give me a good overhead to keep a good bit of history of uh, through time for those files changing. So with all these mechanisms so far, we are protected against hardware failure on-site disaster as well as human error. So obviously the, the off-site version of that uh, daily clone serves as some protection from a ransomware attack. But really with ransomware, you want to be able to go back in time a little bit further through with a version system and the storage mechanism for those backups wants to be offline as in not connected directly to your system. So the drive itself where that data is stored is never directly mounted to your machine. So if you have a virus that, can, that wants to lock all your drives, it can't touch those backups. And that's where Backblaze comes in. So this is an online service. Um, now it's obviously getting a bit confusing with the online and offline. By offline, I mean not connected to the Mac, although Backblaze, of course, is an online tool. So Backblaze gives you 30 days of history in a way where the virus on your Mac can't touch all of those things. So Backblaze is a brilliant mechanism for protection from ransomware. So what this means is the data on our primary active drive that we're working on frequently is in five separate places. So three of those are on-site, one of those has version history as well, and then one is off-site, and then one is offline with version history on that as well. So we were very well protected from all these different risk profiles at this point. So this is a very comprehensive system, but in actual fact, it hasn't cost very much. We're only talking about just normal cheap hard drives and Backblaze which is very affordable as well. And it's almost completely automatic as well. So the only manual thing I'm doing is swapping my daily clone of the drive to become its off-site version of that, you know, once or twice a week. And that's obviously very simple to do. It's not like I have to tell it to do anything. I just literally eject the drive and swap them over. And as long as I'm doing that in the daytime, I know I'm not messing about with it while it's saving the backup because I know that's scheduled to happen overnight. So next we're going to look at the archive drive. Now, just because it's an archive drive doesn't mean I don't want full protection for the data on this drive. The only difference is we know we're not actively working on files. So the the version history element of the backup strategy for this drive is not quite so important. But of course we're using Backblaze and that will run on this drive as well. So we do actually have the 30 day version history for kind of worst case human error issues on that. So the fact we don't need Time Machine running on this drive means we don't need a huge uh, additional Time Machine drive for the data on the archive drive, which is gonna be massive. So that keeps things simple there. The idea being that we're using the biggest available hard drive for this archive drive anyway. So it would actually be impossible to have a single drive uh, sized appropriately to become a time machine back up for this drive anyway. So first of all, we need a basic copy of this drive. And for that, we're gonna actually keep that drive offline. Because we know we're not changing this drive on a daily basis, it's okay just to keep this backup of this drive as the offsite backup. So every time you wanna make an update of it, you can bring it into your house, run the backup, and then move it off site again. Obviously there's a window of time where you haven't got an off site backup. So we need protection against that. But again, that's where Backblaze keeps us covered for that situation as well. If you did want to avoid that downtime for your off site backup, you could do the same thing that we do with the main drive and just have two versions of that backup. One that you keep on site and then you let it 
it run and swap it over every now and again. But obviously you're buying another hard drive and we're trying to keep costs down. So it's about balancing the risk there a little bit. So in terms of specific hardware, what drives we're using for these kinds of setups, the way I like to do this just to keep costs down and keep things simple, I actually have one of these docks which has got two slots for two full size 3.5 inch hard drives. And you can get full size 3.5 inch enterprise drives really cheaply. I'm not quite sure why they're so cheap. There is this question mark if you look at the reviews, people are saying they're, they're sort of ex OEM drives perhaps that haven't been installed in a, in a machine that they were supposed to be or something like that. I don't think you get the full warranty that you're supposed to get and you can see the manufacture date is often a fair bit in the past. But I mean, at the end of the day, they're very cheap drives. We're only really using them in an environment where we know uh, we've got a good backup routine anyway and we need to be protected against a hard drive failure anyway. So if we get a reasonable run out of these drives, I think it's kind of worth it. These enterprise drives also have power uh, management. If they lose their power, they will uh, they have a cache or buffer that will save data and avoid uh, data corruption in the event of power loss. I'd still recommend using a UPS battery backup with everything though. Uh, you know, that's definitely something uh, I've learned over the years. If you do get data corrupted on a drive as a result of power failure, it's very frustrating. Uh, having a battery backup just gives you a few minutes to save and shut down if you're working on stuff actively while that happens. So for the daily clone, I'm actually using a couple of four terabyte small portable hard drives that I already had kicking around. You usually can find some hard drives kicking about and they've got different roles, like you don't need a massive drive for this daily clone. So it's, it's quite good to be able to reuse drives like that. So I've got two of those and those are the ones that I swap over once a week or so to create the offsite version of that daily clone. Obviously, if you're buying all of this from scratch, you could just go ahead and get some more 3.5 inch drives, but you'd need the docks with a total of three slots to be connected at any one time because you want the daily clone always connected, your time machine drive always connected and your archive drive always connected as well. So it's an absolutely fantastic routine. I feel very well protected against all of the worst case scenarios for my data. If you haven't got a setup that gives you as much protection as this, just jump in, just follow the steps in this video, get yourself protected because there's nothing worse than losing data. If you like this workflow, check this video out where I've looked at how you can optimize your command tab application switching workflow using a nice little hack that I've got there. You won't believe how fast it makes switching between applications while you're working with your computer and I'll see you there.